the Huguenot in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Huguenot Calvinists were the complement in Catholic France to the recusants in Protestant England and Wales, both interesting as minorities. But unlike the British recusants, they enjoyed official toleration for much of this period. Um, the whole Calvinist movement started in France with missionaries from Geneva. Um, Calvin was a Frenchman from northern France himself. He settled in Geneva because it wasn't too healthy for him to stay in France. And he, you could say in a way, he Frenchified Protestantism. Lutheranism had been perhaps too German for most French taste. Calvin hammers out his own theology in, oh, in a lot to Luther, but with obviously his clear and somewhat extreme twists, predestination, but he makes it more acceptable to many French people. And from the 1550s, Calvinism spreads out largely from Geneva into southern France, as you might expect. <laughs> well, this culminates from the early 1560s into the early 1590s in very bloody wars of religion in France, which really brings France to her knees. I won't go into details about this. If I did, I'd still be talking in six hours' time. But uh, it manages to get settled. Things managed to get settled in the 1590s. Um, to cut a long story short, the Protestant leader, the Protestant prince, the first Bourbon king, Henri of Navarre, um, succeeds to the throne as Henry IV of France. Um, he has to convert to Catholicism to be um, king of the whole of France. Um, he famously says, Paris is worth a mass, which everyone thinks is terribly cynical but it was the only way he could possibly have ruled France, and the Catholics ex then accept him as king with relief. But to use the old Cockney phrase, it was obvious that he was going to see his Protestant comrades in arms all right, see them right. And the result was the Edict of Nantes of 1598, which was very favourable to the Protestants. Um, they were allowed to hold fortified towns and other strong points and run them. The Protestants got a state within a state. They had crystallized out at about one million, ten percent of the population, spread in pockets, large and small, over the remote mountainous south, Dauphiné, Provence, and Languedoc. Not everywhere, evenly spread, but there. Um, radiating out from Geneva, it's common sense if you look at the map. Um, the connection to Geneva is obvious. There are also quite a lot of Protestants in Normandy. A latter-day Norman Protestant was the famous French writer André Gide, who did most un-Protestant things in his personal life, which I won't go into now, but because he had a Protestant upbringing, felt very guilty about doing so. He died in, 18, he died in 1951. Um, the, the Norman Huguenots were, if you like, part of the North Sea Protestant wave, um, tapping into England and the Netherlands. There were, of course, pockets of Huguenot elsewhere in France. Um, some Huguenot remained very powerful. The comrade in arms of Henry the Fourth in Dauphiné, um, the, he made Duke de la Diguière. He governed Dauphiné from Grenoble. He rebuilt Grenoble, built palaces and castles for himself and became Constable of France, which is equivalent to Earl Marshal in England. So even though the king had become a Catholic, his Protestant comrades did very well. His chief minister, the Duke de Sully, was a Protestant. But in the 17th century... Um, king Henry IV was assassinated in 1610. The Protestants' position slowly worsened, but only slowly. To 1679, sorry, to 1629, Protestant revolts might still occur when they were annoyed. But Richelieu, the minister of Henry's son, Louis XIII, defeated them finally in 1629 and imposed the grace of Allais. Notice, not a treaty, a grace. The privileges they retained were a, a concession officially from the kindness of the king's heart. That was a compromise. It took away their estate within a state, their fortified towns, but still allowed them freedom of conscience to practice religion with a limited number of churches. The second 17th century phase is 1630-1660, the height of the 17th century rapprochement. Um, France was practically a Protestant power in foreign affairs. It had Protestant allies in the Thirty Years' War, and it needed its own Protestants, or else could not afford to antagonize them. The Protestants were very loyal and patriotic. There was no conflict between patriotism and religion vis-a-vis -vis fighting the wicked Spaniards. 
who were Catholics, who were historic enemies of France. Um, Mazarin, the Catholic cardinal, Italian, in fact, not French, who ruled France as prime minister from 1642 to 1661, said about the Huguenots, the little flock may pasture on weeds, that's false doctrine, but at least they do not stray. Then you get the third phase, 1660-1679. The Thirty Years' War has very much been won by France. France is now top power in Europe. Mazarin has died, and young King Louis XIV is ruling personally. Now the great minister's dead. And there's increasing pressure on Protestants. Remember, they'd been losing ground, literally, all through the 17th century, and especially after and through the grace of Allais. Um, Capuchin and other missionaries had tried to get Protestants to voluntarily renounce their religion. Jesuit schools and Ursuline schools opened up in Protestant strongholds to try and get the children of the elite to turn Catholic and so on. Now the pressure was intensified, not just missions from Catholics, but discrimination. Various employments were denied to Huguenot. Um, for example, uh, Huguenot laws of the manor could not appoint Protestant justices or judges to judge uh, the local court cases. But, um, except in isolated incidences, pressure was not yet intolerable, and France had to please um, Protestant allies like Sweden in the 1670s when she got into new wars. And you couldn't do that if you were bloodily repressing your own Protestants. But in 1679, with the Treaty of Nijmegen, France emerges obviously the superpower of Europe, and Louis felt he could do what he liked. So you get the fourth phase, the savagely repressive prelude, 1680-85 to the revocation. Um, all sorts of employments were denied to the Huguenot. In 1684, their churches, known as temples, were bulldozed, or at least they would have been bulldozed if they'd had bulldozers in 1584. They had to adopt different methods of destruction, but destroyed they were. Um, finally, um, in October the 18th, 1685, Louis revoked the Edict of Nantes, the Edict of Fontainebleau. Um, Protestantism could no longer be practised in France officially. Protestants themselves were grudgingly allowed freedom of conscience, but they couldn't practise their religion, either in their churches, which had been raised anyway, or even at home. Um, as a result, hundreds of thousands of Protestants left the country. Louis thought he was completing a perfect Catholic land, this didn't work, because even many Catholics were horrified at his deed. Um, France's loss was the gain of many other countries, um, the Netherlands, Brandenburg and other German states, and England. Um, Huguenots went there, were useful both in the armies fighting against France, and also as craftsmen and financiers. The Bank of England was founded in 1694 by a Huguenot called Hublon, among others, for example, fighting against his own country, and for King William, the ruler of the Netherlands and of England. Um, even to this day, many people in England, and even more in northern Germany, can trace part of their descent back to Huguenot ancestors. It's interesting because the revocation, you compare it, because it's almost a prolepsis of the Nazi and Soviet persecutions of living memory, and indeed persecutions are going on in more minor dictatorships today. If we had time, we compare the differences and similarities between Louis's state terrorism and the state terrorism of the 20th century, but we haven't got time. Lastly, why were the French Calvinists called Huguenot? I don't know, you tell me. There have been many ingenious explanations why they got this nickname, but none of them were particularly convincing. <laughs>